to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility, and representation. I'm your host, Laura. I'm a white woman with bright blue hair, shaved on one side, wearing a Star Wars trans flag pattern shirt. As a gamer with a coordination disability, I really struggle to play racing games. I love them in theory, I love the idea of speeding around a track at full speed, but I have a lot of difficulty with fine motor controls, which in a lot of racing games, particularly sim-style racing games, can be very tricky. My brain doesn't do a good job of telling my hands to make small, accurate movements, and when you need to accelerate just a little bit more, or just apply a little bit of brake or steer a little bit more softly than you are, that can be really tricky. This past week, I've been playing Gran Turismo 7 on PlayStation 5. The Gran Turismo series has always been a very sim-heavy racing series, and considering that Sony, as of late, has been really good with accessibility by and large, I wanted to give this game a look and see whether it would finally be the sim-style racing game or the Gran Turismo series entry that I would find accessible. So today, on Access Ability, we're going to be talking about Gran Turismo 7's accessibility support. We're going to talk about what settings the game has, which settings it lacks, and which settings are unfortunately applied inconsistently, which has, as of late, also become a bit of a Sony issue. If you've played recent entries in the Gran Turismo series, such as Gran Turismo 6 and Gran Turismo Sport, you're going to find a lot of what's on offer in Gran Turismo 7 disappointingly familiar in terms of accessibility. Compared to the rest of Sony's first-party output on PS5, this is easily the least improved accessibility support in a PS5 sequel to a PS4 game so far. Gran Turismo 7 offers players preset options of how to control their car, which can be tweaked ranging from a traditional setup where L2 is the brake, R2 accelerates, the left stick steers, through to a motion controlled option with the right stick dedicated to acceleration and deceleration. The game does feature full controller remapping, which can help to further customise this control setup. Then, players are offered three simulation complexity presets, which can also be tweaked. These change a lot of minor aspects of car control behind the scenes, such as turning up levels of traction to keep you gripped to the road, but also changes a few more immediately obvious things, such as whether the game automates basic processes such as steering and braking for you. Much like Forza Horizon 5, Gran Turismo 7 offers players a driving line on the road to show them where they should optimally be positioned on the track, markings to show where you should be hitting the brakes, and options to either automate changing gears, or tell you which gear you should likely be in at that moment. The game also features three difficulty settings which dictate the speed that AI enemy drivers race around the track, but doesn't tweak the difficulty of other challenges, which we'll get back to in a minute. While all of these tools do help to make this technical sim more manageable to play, they come with limitations and drawbacks, and even at their best do not make this as playable for disabled players as something a little less simulation heavy like Forza Horizon 5, and I promise there's a reason I'm making that comparison, I'll get back to it later. Here are some examples of areas where Gran Turismo 7's approach to accessibility falls a little short. In order to keep players better gripped to the road, the beginner control option turns up your vehicle's traction. This does improve grip, but it slows down your ability to take fast corners or accelerate back up to maximum speed quickly. This is a trade-off being made, and certain in-game challenges which involve travelling at speed, going through lots of slaloming corners, do not adjust their completion times to account for this. This will make some challenges more difficult to complete rather than easier. Yes, you're not spinning out, but you're not taking the turns as quickly as the game is expecting you to. While the game's driving line inclusion is great, the fact that in-game weather effects such as rain being sprayed up from the road by another car's tyres can make this driving line impossible to see. If the driving line is there as an accessibility setting, it should always be able to be seen. Don't hide accessibility settings from a player that they've chosen to switch on. This is also the second Sony first-party game in a row to release without support for high contrast mode visuals. A disappointing omission. The setting had seemed like it was becoming somewhat of a Sony PlayStation standard, but 
it seems like that isn't the case and that's a real shame. Optional braking lines on the road can tell you when to hit the brakes, but they don't give you any further information. If you're driving on the driving line and hit the brakes when you're told and you still fail to make your turn properly, the game doesn't help to teach you whether you were meant to feather your use of the brake, or slam the brake on and drop the acceleration as you did the turn, or accelerate fully while also having the brake on full. The game's on-road tips are not as clearly communicated to the player as they could be, or have been in other titles, such as Forza Horizon 5, that is a recent one that did that really well. In-game driving license tutorials, while not mandatory, have content locked behind them, such as unlocking new cars. And the problem with those is that they do not scale in difficulty, and they turn off all of your accessibility support features without warning. I get that these are designed to teach you how to use features such as the brakes, but accessibility support options should never be turned off without warning in a way that blocks access to some in-game content. While navigating in-game menus, the left stick can be used to move essentially a virtual mouse pointer, but players also have the option thankfully to use the D-pad to snap between options. Additionally, of note, the game's setting options are spread out between multiple different settings menus in a way that can make them really hard to find. There are dedicated sound and visual editing menus for the overall game, but also car menus that only change car specific settings as well as a separate control customization menu too, that are all found in separate places. Gran Turismo 7 also refuses to hold the player's hand in regards to vehicle customization. There's a fine tuning menu on offer that has no tutorial whatsoever, simply expecting players to already understand the changes that are being offered to them, or be too intimidated by the menu to mess with the mechanics. This is Gran Turismo 7 top to bottom, it either wants you to not bother at all with a mechanic, or dive in the deep end with no gradual teaching. For those of you who struggle with randomised rewards and microtransactions where you can pay to unlock in-game content early, Gran Turismo 7 unfortunately employs some tactics to push you towards additional spending. Every now and then the game will give players a randomised reward ticket which offers in-game currency or potentially a new vehicle. If you earn in-game currency, you will be prompted that you can purchase more currency with real money, at just as you win and have the big alarm bells going off of dopamine, hooray I won some currency, ooh I could buy more currency, I can see how this could be a problem for some players. You can opt not to redeem these randomised reward tickets, but they will constantly have a little notification in a red box with a number on the home screen making ignoring them hard for some disabled players who struggle to not engage with mechanics when there's numbers reminding them to do it. This pushing for microtransaction spending also extends to other areas of the game. If you try to purchase a new in-game car that you lack the funds for, it will push you to buy the difference in currency using real-world money with a prompt. While Gran Turismo 7 does have some accessibility support settings that make it a little easier to play, it's got some settings to not have to deal with certain elements of the controls or certain elements of how the cars work, and it does have settings to make the difficulty easier so that enemy AI racers are a little less aggressive on the road, but at its core this is still a simulation racer, and I think this is ultimately a conversation we're going to have about Sims at some point, is that Sim game developers seem to look at their games and go, yeah, but we're trying to simulate the real experience and therefore we need to leave a certain degree of inaccessibility in there because that's realistic and Gran Turismo 7 doesn't change that. It's another Sim game that goes, hey, you know what? Mm, we're going to make it a little bit difficult to play because it's a Sim and we're not going to make it so that you can just play it like a racing game if you want. That's not a criticism of Gran Turismo 7 necessarily, but it is something about the sim genre that is not being addressed here and that I kind of want to do a longer video about at some point. If you're looking for an accessible next generation racing game, I wouldn't recommend Gran Turismo 7 if you're someone who, like me, struggles with fine motor control. What I would suggest instead, and I know I've brought it up a couple of times in this video, is Forza Horizon 5. That is a game that, if nothing else, 
offers players the ability to rewind their gameplay a few seconds without any penalty in single player play. And I've found that that has made a much bigger difference to me being able to play than anything that Gran Turismo 7 has done. Because I'm allowed to undo little mistakes I've made and retry certain things without penalty in Forza Horizon 5, I'm a lot more willing to take off those training wheels and engage with the racing game's mechanics and not be afraid to try and engage with more of the mechanics of how these cars work. Gran Turismo 7 is unforgiving in that regard. It either will do things for you, or it will entirely be overwhelming, and there's no real middle point in there. There's no degrees of support, it's either, oh this is too hard, we'll do it for you, or okay, do it yourself, but it's a technical sim and it's going to be impossible, and between the two, Forza Horizon 5 just feels like it's doing a much better job of being a welcoming game for someone with a coordination disability. I want to repeat that I think unforgiving is the best word to describe Gran Turismo 7 with. I'm not saying it's not a good game, I'm not making quality judgement on the game itself, but if you, like me, require some accessibility settings to help you get on with racing games, this isn't the racing game that I would recommend. There are games that do a much better job of onboarding you with gradual levels of accessibility support and easing you up to the expected experience, whereas here there's just this big huge gulf that is very difficult to cross and that the game makes no real attempt to help you graduate over. <laughs>